that the desire of your heart this morning? No, it is mine. Amen. Well, before I read the text today, and I'll just warn them, poor Johnny back there, that I'm going to be taking the text in pieces, so just my apologies. Thanks for putting up with me. Appreciate you. Before we get there, I heard that uh, there's a guy uh, that has a couple Super Bowl tickets, and he's got 50-yard line box seats. He paid $1,500 for each ticket, but he didn't realize that when he bought them last year, he was going to be on the same day as his wedding. So if you're interested and you're willing to, to hurry, he's looking for somebody to take his place. It's going to be in Kearney, Nebraska, about 5.30 p.m. at the First Baptist Church. <laughs> Her name is Judy. She's 5'2", about 105 pounds. She's a good cook, and she'll be the one in the long white dress. I'm like, uh, I'm like this fictional character uh, that didn't keep his word. God is bound by his word, amen? God must keep his word, or he becomes a liar. So he's bound by his word. Now carry those thoughts forward. And understand that the Word of God is no longer just a mere book with fictional words, but God is bound by His Word. Those are His words. Hebrews 4, 12-13 tells us this. It says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. The Word is alive. And he's true to his word. It's this need to give a future account that Hebrews talks about. Uh, and that causes Jesus to be so very concerned about how we live out our lives, everyday lives. While it's true that Jesus mentions that love should be the motive for all good actions, and that's true. But he constantly refers to specific actions, if you, if you actually read scripture. And outcomes that reveal what's actually in the heart so that people can repent. So... While Jesus does speak of love, and, and that's important, you must have that. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, love your neighbors, yourself. And while that is true, Jesus talks about issues, real issues, that reveal when our hearts aren't quite where they're supposed to be. Amen? And if Jesus' ministry were on earth today, I don't know if he'd get the top TV spots, quite frankly. Because Jesus claimed that hell was real, and some people are going there. And in today's feel-good church, Jesus wouldn't have been washed by most Western professing Christian believers. And I say that because Barna Research tells us that only 20% of Christian believers actually have a biblical worldview. Only 20%. And that's a, that's a shame, but let's read from Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus preaches a godly message for all that need to repent. And I'll, I'll just show you what I mean by this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Jesus preached about judgment. If he was on TV, a lot of people would be turning the channel right now. When he said the word judgment, they'd go, click, I'm done with that guy. Whoever he is, I don't know who he is. He goes on, verse 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter. He's saying that anybody who's angry with their brother is subject to judgment. Again, that word, I'm not putting the words in there, I'm just reading. This isn't me, this is Christ. I mean, who does he think he is? God? Matter of fact, he didn't claim to be God. Again, anybody who says to his brother, Raka, he says, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Let me just stop here just a second. The church of Jesus' day taught that your actions were how you committed sin. It was the action that was the sin. That's taught a lot today too, I'm sorry to say. But Jesus is telling people, you need to know that what's in your heart is sin. It's the heart where sin takes place. The action is just the expression of the sin that's already there. Now we can begin to understand why Jesus talks so much about sin. Because people are carrying around sin in their hearts and they desperately need to repent. But Jesus wants them to know how that heart works itself out so they know that there, there's sin in here. You know, we can make excuses for ourselves a lot. We can say, oh, well, I'm better than so-and-so. Or, or I don't do that. So-and-so does that. I, I'm a little better. We, we compare ourselves to others. Bad. Bad news. Compare 
yourself to Christ. If you want to make a comparison. The fact is people are carrying around sin in their hearts and they desperately need to repent. And that's what Jesus does. He wants to heal the sin sick heart. People have a tendency to carry their sins around as though their sin is normal and as though it's fine. But, but we need somebody to call out our sins at times and offer us the forgiveness that only God could give so that we can be set free from our heart's deceived condition. You know, one of the things that you learn in uh, communication, uh, communication 101, is there's this thing called Jahari Window. If you don't have people talking to you about your blind spot, we all have blind spots. I know that's a shock for some of you. You think you know everything about yourself. There are things you do you don't know you do. Other people see it, and unless you open yourself up and are accountable to them and give them the freedom to tell you what's happening, you won't even know you're doing it some of the times. Or maybe you won't know the consequences of your actions of what you're doing. So we need people to share with us, to speak into our lives, or we won't grow. And that's a part of growth. It's something that church and Bible study is all about, is helping us to grow, to be better human beings. Jesus speaks into lives often when he's, when he's here on this earth. But there's a, there's a movement today to stop calling out sin, reminding people of the real state of what's in their hearts. And Jesus wouldn't stop this practice of calling sin, sin. And he did it with the big shots, too. He didn't just do it, you know, with the, with the people that couldn't get back up. He did it with the big shots, the folks that were in power and the folks that had kind of control, which is why he ended up on a cross. He loved him enough to tell him the truth, and it cost him his life. God knows that we walk around day in and day out with stuff we need to deal with. And there are times when we recognize our failing, and at those moments, we, we need to deal with it right then. Jesus shares such another situation in verses 23 and 24. We'll go on in Matthew. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there, remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift in front of the altar. First go be reconciled to your brother. Then come back and offer your gift. When you know that you're at odds with somebody else, don't even try to worship God. It's not, it's not going to work. You can't do it with a clear conscience or a pure heart. Go and deal with making peace first. Deal with your animosities, your angers, your divisions first. Then come back and worship God. You, you can't worship God in a spirit and truth when you're in contention with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, to think that you can be a good Christian while ignoring others' feelings when they have good reason to be upset with you is, is to live a lie. And over time, a person can get very good at lying to themselves about what's in their heart. But the reality is that it's going to eat at you often. Uh, it will come out in some form of a physical manifestation. A lot of people that carry around unforgiveness and as they grow older, they get angry, they get upset. Um, it just it begins to eat at them. You get heart attacks, you get other conditions, internal organs, things happen. When we don't deal with the spiritual, it can often come out physically. I've known numerous people that have been at odds with others, and as they age, they become increasingly alienated from everyone as well. Often people who are really hurt inside, but instead of dealing with their pain, they they seek to push other people away to try to get close to them. You see this with foster children that no longer want to bond with, with their new home parents. They've been passed around so much they're afraid that, that if they bond and if they get close, they're just going to get hurt again. So they put up great walls and, and they stop being vulnerable. Humans need to be vulnerable and willing to love others if we're going to fulfill what it is we were created to be and do. And if we wish to be useful and happy in this life, it's not easy, but, but Jesus really provides a way for us to find deliverance and peace while we're here on this earth. And it starts with Him. might require some therapy, but deliverance and peace are attainable. And it might also entail forgiving others. It's a must, according to Scripture. The reality is we must not only forgive others to be forgiven by God, but we need to seek peace with others as much as it depends on us. We, we need to strive to be peacemakers whenever humanly possible. To be good at it, we, we have to learn to remain humble ourselves and be intentional about maintaining a good relationship with God and other believers. There, there will be times when you have somebody you just can't seem to be at peace with. It happens. There are those people out there. 
But instead of ignoring it, Jesus wants us to deal with it as quickly as we can, not wait about it, not wait around, and, and let it stew. But sometimes we can be pretty stubborn and lose sight of the importance of, of a strained relationship. Usually because we become too proud or to humble ourselves and, and to be the ones instrumental in mending the relationship. We don't want to make the first step. We don't, our pride gets in the way. Often we say things like, well, it's the principle of the thing. You don't know it's the principle of the thing. And this is kind of code speak for, well, they hurt me and I refuse to forgive them. Or it might be, uh, I feel cheated and I'm not going to make the first move because I'm too proud. It's code speak. But the reality is that person is really just not any longer being valued by that. Jesus cares about everyone in every relationship. He died a horrible death in order to have a relationship with us. And we can struggle a little bit to maintain relationships in this life. Amen? We can do that. God gives us the strength. Jesus tells us this pride-based mindset is a dangerous place to be. Verse 25 goes on to say, Settle matters quickly with your adversary. Who's taking you to court? Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge. The judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. Now, I know Jesus is speaking specifically about a real physical prison, but he's also talking about a spiritual life sentence. Now, in his day, when you were in prison for a debt, you had no possible way to pay it back. If you're in prison, you couldn't earn money by making license plates. You know, there was... There was no gifting being done in prisons. It wasn't, if you got a meal a day, you were feeling pretty good about it. Three squares and cable TV and college wasn't going on back then. And when you were in prison by Rome, it was usually a life sentence. But the Hebrew law, God's law, offered what was called a year of jubilee. Some of you may know what this is. There was one year out of 40 when God's law demanded that all slaves... And basically, a slave in the, in the Hebrew culture was someone who you owed such a debt, you couldn't pay it back. And so you became the bond servant or the slave of this person you owed money to. And you would go, and you would have to be their higher hand. You'd have to work it off and work for them. And so you would go do that. And if a slave loved their master, when this year of Jubilee came around, 40 years, you know, you might be a slave this year. It might only be five years before the year of Jubilee comes up. So you think, well, I'll work for him for five years to try to pay back this debt. So people would do that. And when that, five, when that time was up and the year of Jubilee came around, whenever it was, you had a choice. You could be set free or you could remain their slave, their bond servant. And if you wanted to remain their slave, they would go out to their doorpost and you put your ear up against it and they'd take it all and they'd poke a hole in your ear. And that was a sign that you were someone's sponsor for life. You were doing it for life. And there were those who did that. Some of those uh, uh, people who, who they owed money to were so kind to them and so gracious to them and provided meals for them and that they wanted. They loved them and they stayed. And that did happen. But God gave everyone a way out. The victim could get back some of their money. The perpetrator would work for the one they failed to pay. And the two had to had to work together in a relationship setting. You see what's happening here? God's forcing them to work together. The bond servant now has to work for the other guy, the master. And they've got to work it out. And I'm sure they were stressed at first, but, but they had to find a way to work through things because God's concerned about relationships. Both knowing that one would be free one day, they'd both not, no longer be in a slave-master relationship unless... Unless the one said, you know, I, I'll, be, I'll be your servant. I'll be the one, your, your hired hand, your, maybe your, your right hand, you know, as they say. Jesus has made a way for us to be free from our sins as well and at peace with God now. Jesus made a way every day for us to have a year of jubilee. That ought to excite the hardest of hearts. But let's go on in this Jesus sermon here. Then Jesus turns to the sin of adultery, verse 27. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In Jesus' day, you know this, men and women dressed in very long garments, and unless you were watching somebody bathe on the rooftop like King David did, you're probably not going to get an eyeful. In our culture, about all you got to do is go to Walmart, you might get an eyeful. 
uh, it's a little different in our particular culture, the way that people dress and respond. Uh, you literally might have to turn the TV off when something comes on the TV to keep your mind from those places. I don't know you, you don't, I don't know how that works for you, but you might have to. Did you know that Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look at a young woman? You have to know your limitations and not allow your mind to go too far. You can't watch Fifty Shades of Blackness and not have your mind go to sin. And I, know, I said what I meant to say, blackness. When I was in college, I learned that I could be walking on the beach and I could look around without sin. And depending on how long I was prayed up, I might be able to focus on something out there and say, man, that is quite the creation of God. And I had about 15 to 30 seconds, depending upon how prayed up I was, before my mind would go somewhere it shouldn't. And so I learned, look and look away. And if that doesn't work, you start reciting scripture. But think about what you're thinking about. Control your thoughts. Take every thought captive and do not let your mind run away from you. And control you. Now, not everybody's willing to guard their thoughts like this. But I can tell you, you'll be much more confident in your relationship with God if you will guard your mind by thinking what you should be thinking about. Did you hear what I said? Your relationship with God will be much more confident. You'll, you'll feel good about your relationship with God. You won't be asking, you won't say things like, well, I hope I'm going to go to heaven. You'll have a relationship close enough with God to know that you're in right standing with God. Verse 29 says this, If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. We're not going to be cutting hands or poking eyes out this morning, so don't worry. This is probably where Jesus is using something called hyperbole. He is, he is making a, a statement that goes beyond what he really expects to show you the depth and the value and the importance of what he's saying. That said, we still need to get the point. The point being that no matter how much you have to deny your flesh, or as Paul says, crucify the flesh in order to follow after Christ, Jesus says do it. Because it'll keep you from hell. It'll also keep you from numerous hurts and habits and hang-ups which try to imprison you while you're in this world. Perhaps the biggest hurt causing numerous hang-ups in entire families comes from the horrible event called divorce. And every family's been touched by it. In verse 31, Jesus says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. Anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Just know that Jesus is recorded speaking about divorce in other Gospels as well. But I'm not going to get into the nuances that keep people imprisoned in their shame and guilt this morning. Is it a sin? Yes, it is. Is there forgiveness? Absolutely. But instead, what I want to point out here is that Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter once again. He's telling men, in this instance, that be just because they can say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you three times, and then they are legally divorced in that particular culture. So just because you can do that doesn't mean you should. Doesn't mean you should. Because it makes you culpable for your, I guess after that would be ex-wife's life for the rest of her life. You are responsible for what you've done to her the rest of her life. Traditionally, today, we take a vow, and today's tradition, about the last I don't know, four or five hundred years or so, we've said to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto, we, most of us, pledge thee our faith. Some of you might remember those words. Very traditional. Jesus is talking about the pain and suffering we do to other people when we break our mouths. How do I know this? Because the very next thing Jesus goes into is this, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. 
And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair, neither white nor black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Are we oath keepers? Are you someone who keeps your word? We try, but we are human. We fall short at times. I can remember times when I told my daughter I was going to do something with her, and somebody in my church passed away, and I had to do a funeral instead. You hate that when it happens. It, especially with, I don't know about you, but little girls, they, they get me wrapped around their little finger. And I really hate to break my word to little girls. I don't know what it is. Because it, you can almost see the pain in their eyes. It's like, there's that mournful look and it just breaks your heart. It's not always easy to keep your word in this life, but we have to strive to do that. God has no problem keeping his word, although some might disagree. God's word is a lie. Many of the things written within God's word today are yet to come to pass. But they will come to pass. God tells us that he's coming back. Jesus said he was coming back, and we can believe that because so many things have come true that were prophesied about over the thousands of years. Jesus himself has numerous prophecies about him. And the book of Matthew is quick to point out that the prophets foretold of his coming, of this Messiah. God knows that we make mistakes, and yet he still loves us. God knows that we're harboring bad thoughts at times, and he warns us. He says, stop that. That's not in your best interest. I'm, I'm trying to help you, but you gotta, you got to work with me here. I'm trying to steer you right, but you got to listen. God knows that we do things that hurt others, and he tells us, stop that. God knows that we can be ensnared by our own sins, and we often need help to break free from those sins. And Jesus made a way to free us from sin. And he tells us of those sins, so we know just how much we need his help. Now, some of you this morning might still be beating yourselves over uh, past sins. Divorce, something or other. But God can set you free from your guilt, your shame, and your sin. There's forgiveness for all sins, and God offers freedom and forgiveness to those who will embrace Christ and give Him their whole being. Some of you may have unclean thoughts. You've been wondering how to how you're going to get out of that. Maybe the maybe the porn on computers and TVs has made it readily, so readily available in your own home that maybe it's just too easy, or maybe your church family doesn't know it, but you and God do it. And Jesus is calling you this morning to do something radical in order to purge it from your view. Maybe, maybe you need to cut the cord or tell your TV provider to remove it. I knew of pastors that when they went to uh, went out on speaking engagements, they would and they didn't have a problem with it necessarily, but it was a temptation. They'd say, "Take the TV out of my room." You say, "What for? Just don't watch it. Take the TV out of my room. I don't want it to be a temptation." I know that goes a long way. You might say in your heart, but. I even think about it. Why even bother about it? Maybe you have an anger problem or holding on to past grievances. If you maybe you got a black book in your mind where you keep the names of the people who've wronged you. Please hear me. You can't have a good relationship with God and be in defiance of real forgiveness of others. Jesus said, if you forgive men their sins when they sin against you, God will forgive your sins. If you do not, God will not forgive your sins. It will create animosity between you and God if you don't forgive. Jesus can break the chains of all bondages, not just the ones that I've read about, but all bondages. And he's here, ready, willing, and able to set you free from, from any of those that have placed you in bondage. He wants you to be free to have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, free from guilt, free from shame, free from condemnation. And yes, we have all sinned, but what matters is that you give it all to God, to repent of the sin and live with God in the present. And from this day on, that you strive for godly perfection in your future. You can be so much more in God than you've ever imagined. God has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. And getting you to let go of your baggage is the first step in preparing you to fulfill that divine call. Some of you may have let go of it once, only to find that maybe days, weeks, months, or years later, you had put it in your proverbial back pocket. You thought you let go. But you find out years later you're still carrying it around when it leaps out at you. God wants to set you free from all sins. And some people say, then why do you keep reminding us of our sins? Well, if we don't call sin what it is, the lost will never know they need delivered. And once we have been delivered, we need to begin a real relationship with Christ or we're going to slip back into feeling condemned. 
Now, I believe the Western church is having so many problems today because it's walked away from this idea of an intimate relationship with Christ. And we've tried to train it for a knowledge about Christ. But there's a difference between knowing about someone, reading a biography, an autobiography even, and knowing the writer. Total difference. When you do not have a relationship with someone, you might not be sure that the way you once wronged them is still forgiven. Think about it for a moment. When you hear others talk about people doing what you did wrong to others, there might be shame that comes back or guilt that comes over you. Uh, the devil likes to remind you about your past. But we need Christ in our lives in the present to remind us of whose we really are. When you have a relationship with someone, even though you know you're wrong with them, you know that there's, you're still close to them and your relationship is still good because you spoke to them this morning and, and you love them even more and more because even though you're wrong, they still love you. Which makes you respect them and honor them even more. And you're not worried about what happened in the past. Not that you, you're proud of it, don't get me wrong, but you're not worried about it because your relationship is still tight. But step away from that person for a while. Don't talk with them for a while. Have nothing to do with them maybe for years. And you might think, I wonder if they, I wonder. And that beginning of wandering is the process. When we wander away from Christ, we begin to wander away from the truth that he loves us intimately and dearly and he's truly forgiven us. Some people are waiting to be in the presence of God, but born-again believers are walking in the presence of God today. And they're asking, they're asking God each and every day how He's doing, telling Him he loved, they love Him. And they're worshiping Him. And in response, God is pouring His love back out in them. And there's a confidence that they have. There's a happiness, a peace, and joy. And even though they might hear of something called sin, and they read it in Scripture, they say, I'm so glad God delivered me of that. Boy, that was good. It's forgiven. It's in the past. It's gone. I don't even think about it anymore. No need to look back. But only look forward. Born again believers are walking in the presence of God now, and and asking for you to please do the same. God's word offers rest to all who are weary and heavy laden. Asking them to come to him. And he says, I will give you rest. So this morning, let us all seek him. Until we find this rest he speaks of. Until we make peace. That passes all understanding. And the condemnation and the guilt and the shame is gone. Because God forgives and forgets. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. It doesn't matter what they were. He forgives them. And he offers that to you. Peace. Complete and total peace. For all who come to him. Amen.